are the battlefields that have become this of women domains. To commemorate is to remember. To ensure that the past is not just a matter of nostalgia, but a lesson that helps us forge our destiny. In celebrating the courage of this soldier, we recognize the heroism found in looking beyond oneself on one's own interest for the love of one country and sisters' countries. The message of Yorktown, like that of every act of liberation, every struggle of ashes to ashes freedom, is that men and women always determine their own future. The future for which they have sacrificed is our present today. Freedom, brotherhood, and democracy are the most noble causes, the ones to which we must devote all our strength. And today, we are united against terrorism in the way in, in law of part in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, all these anonymous soldiers who lay at rest in these grounds around us, and to whom they pay tribute this year again, sleep reunited for all eternity alongside all heroes who sacrificed their young life for a just a good. Vive les États-Unis d'Amérique, vive la France, vive l'amitié entre les États-Unis et la France. He is the Vice President of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation at Monticello in Virginia, the Saunders Director of the Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies at Monticello, and Professor of History at the University of Virginia. Born in Cheshire in 1959, Professor O'Shaughnessy was educated at Bedford School and at Oriel College, University of Oxford. After completing his Bachelor of Arts and Doctor of Philosophy at Oriel College, he taught at Eton College. He was subsequently appointed as a visiting professor at Southern Methodist University in Dallas and as a professor of American history at the University of Wisconsin, Oshkosh, where he was the chair of the history department between 1998 and 2003. Professor O'Shaughnessy is the author of An Empire Divided, The American Revolution and the British Caribbean. His most recent book, The Men Who Lost America, British Leadership, The American Revolution and the Fate of the Empire, received five national awards, including the New York Historical Society American History Book Prize and the George Washington Book Prize. A fellow of the Royal Historical Society, Dr. O'Shaughnessy is co-editor of Old World, New World, America and Europe in the Age of Jefferson, and a co-editor of the Jeffersonian American Series, published by the University of Virginia Press. Dr. O'Shaughnessy's father is an emeritus professor of the Columbia University Business School. His brother is professor of communications at Queen Mary College, London University. Professor O'Shaughnessy is a joint citizen of the United Kingdom and the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome me as we greet our speaker, Dr. Andrew Jackson O'Shaughnessy. Thank you very much. It's really a privilege to be with you today. October the 19th is a day to really celebrate, but it was not a day that they were celebrating in London in 1781. The official news of the British defeat arrived on November the 25th at noon on a Sunday, 1781. The British had been expecting news of a great victory. Cornwallis, only a few weeks earlier in the British press, was being described as a second Hannibal. There were very few American troops in Virginia. The few who were here 
were led by the Marquis de Lafayette. Virginia seemed wide open. They took Richmond, they took Charlottesville, they occupied Monticello. They nearly captured Thomas Jefferson, they captured members of the state legislature, they captured Daniel Boone. The king was due two days later after the news arrived to give a speech before Parliament. And he'd already, in the speech, spoken of a great victory in America. But it was not the victory that he was expecting. It was an American victory. The night that the news arrived, the first person to hear it was the British <coughs> Secretary of State for America, Lord George Germain. And he was having a dinner party for nine people. Only one of the guests knew about the defeat. All the other guests were unaware of what had happened that day. So they sat down to dinner in Pall Mall near Buckingham Palace, then known as the Queen's House. And they talked generally until the daughters had left the room, the daughters of the host. And then someone happened to mention that the French foreign minister was dying. And another guest said, gosh, that's a shame. If I'd have been the French foreign minister, I would have wanted to know what happened in America. I wouldn't have wanted to die before the outcome was known. And Lord George Germain at the head of the table said he knew because word had arrived in France earlier. And then Germain announced that Lord Cornwallis and his force had surrendered at Yorktown. And then at that moment a dispatch arrived from the King. Everyone wanted to know at the dinner party how the King, George III, had reacted. George III had become the leading war hawk. He twice wrote out his abdication speech rather than accept the idea of a British withdrawal from America. He said that if Britain lost America, it would cease to be a major power. So they read out his message, which was simply that this was a setback, but we will go on. And that was indeed the intention of the government, and they could have gone on. They still had their main army in New York, they still had Savannah, they still had Charleston, they still had bits of Maine and Canada. Most of the victorious French and American troops here on October the 19th believed that this was the end. But the war went on for another year and a half. They continued to be fighting. And George Washington was particularly worried that Americans would be complacent after Yorktown. He still believed that the main battle was ahead. These were still perilous months. There was an officer-wide conspiracy in the American army, the Newburgh Conspiracy, months after Yorktown. The revolution was going bankrupt. Washington had only been able to march from New York because of personal loans from the French general Rochambeau to pay his army. Congress could not tax. The wages of the army were in arrears. And a few months later, the British won a great naval victory in April of 1782 at the Saints in the Caribbean, in which they defeated and captured de Grasse, the great victor here at the Chesapeake Capes. But the reason Yorktown is such an important victory was that Yorktown persuaded members of the British Parliament that they could never win in America. They tried to believe that the majority of Americans wanted Britain to remain. Yorktown finally dispelled that idea. And in the months after Yorktown, the government lost its majority. Even army officers sitting in Parliament voted against continuing the war. It had been the most perfect 
campaign, logistically, the coordination. But it's remarkable as we look back to realize that much of it came together at very short notice. It was not pre-planned. Washington thought the main battle would be in New York against the main British Army. The unsung hero of this battle was Admiral de Grasse. And I'm very glad that the DAR here in Yorktown commemorate his name, because it was de Grasse who took the British generals by surprise. They had been assured that the British would have command of the seas. And de Grasse took a great risk with his career and his reputation by failing to send any of his ships back to France, exceeding his orders to stay longer in America, and bringing the entire French Navy up to the Chesapeake. He left the Spanish Navy to protect French islands in the Caribbean, and he left the French convoy to go home unattended. It was an incredible risk, but as a result, the French Navy for virtually the only time in the 18th century, outnumbered the British Navy. The other brilliant moment was George Washington marching down from New York. It should never have happened. The British were supposed to intercept any movement of his army. Sir Henry Clinton had more troops than Cornwallis in New York. He should have cut off any march south. But Washington brilliantly deceived the British into thinking that his army was still there, leaving the campfires alight and playing a game of subterfuge. And so thanks to chance, thanks to courage, thanks to that magnificent moment, we can celebrate today the end of the American Revolutionary War. And I'm glad to say that today it can also be celebrated in Britain because, of course, centuries later, it would be America that would come to the defense of Britain's liberties and France's liberties in World War II. Thank you. It's important for us to bear in mind, however, that independence and freedom require no less vigilance to maintain today than was required by our colonial forebars 234 years ago. We pause during today's commemoration to remember our fighting men and women currently serving in harm's way in the air, on land, and at sea around the world and note their role in the continuing fight to maintain independence. In the darkest hours of the American Revolution, Tom And now to honor America and all those who won our independence at Yorktown in 1781. God, we have this word, sacrifice, and we ask it to bear so much freight, more than it is able. For it literally means to make holy. And so ways and processes to make something holy. To ourselves, give when it hurts. We come here to honor the dead of many generations. We trust them to you. And we come to give thanks for all that lies before. And that we ourselves, in our own sacrifices, might in some ways make this place and this life holy. This we pray in your strong name. Amen.
Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's patriotic exercises. We thank you for your participation today and look forward to seeing you again next year for the 235th anniversary celebration of the victory at Yorktown.